I don't really see these patients, okay? Because I, I used to see them in the late 80s, early 90s, but you know, I really, I'm an endocrinologist, I do endocrinology and metabolism, uh, but basically that part of my uh, uh, practice kind of dried up in the early 90s because it's just, you know, the cardiologist took it over, right? And they just, you know, and the primary care doctor, it's easy to prescribe a statin. So I don't actually have to deal with these patients. But lo and behold, a patient did come into my office just a couple of months ago while I'm preparing this talk for Ellen and Sam. And uh, I'd already given it to the Bay State Division. And she came to me with this exact question, which I see maybe two people a year like this, you know, it's happened to show up. And she's a 74-year-old woman. She was advised to begin a statin because uh, well, okay, here's her history. She had prediabetes in 2003, diet and exercise, so she never advanced. She didn't go on drugs, never advanced to frank diabetes, okay? Along the way, she got a little hypertension. She's been on lisinopril, well-controlled hypertension. And then, you know, from the exercise, she got some back pain, and lo and behold, the radiologist read diffuse aortic atherosclerosis, so then her primary tested her LDL, and this was basically very similar to, don't, don't think she's never had her LDL cholesterol checked before she has, and this is always the way it's been. And despite this, her PCB advised her to begin statin, but she was reluctant, and her husband had come to see me years previously over another issue, and so she came to see me, and I took her history. She had no other personal risk factors, and uh, she had no family history, but her father, who also had chronic features of the dysmetabolic syndrome, diabetes, hypertension, et cetera, he had died of an MI at age 80, okay? I took a look at her prior x-ray file, and in retrospect, I found this abdominal CT scan for an unrelated reason, and, the, and there you see her diffuse aortic atherosclerosis. Okay, so this was there in 2013. It wasn't mentioned by the radiologist. Some radiologists mention this, some don't mention it. So they didn't mention it, so she didn't know about it for a couple of years, and it's probably been there forever and ever. I mean, it just starts when you're a teenager. You know, it starts in your 20s. And so, and, and like the heinz nixdorf data, this is an advancement that you really can't stop. You can just slow it down, perhaps, because this is a disease of aging. So now, interestingly, she came to her consult with her husband, who is a retired professor of mathematics. So I said, great, I'm no statistician. I'm preparing this talk. I don't know really what I'm talking about here, right? I, statistics was my weak point, really, in, in college and medical school. And you know, I said, well, I'm going to try, you know, I'll try this talk out on, on her husband in the office. So here's what I said. Well, I didn't say this. Okay, this is what my primary care physician says to me all the time. I didn't say there are three kinds of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics, but I did quote quite a bit from Princeton's book on stats.con, okay? How we've been fooled by statistics-based research in medicine. Okay. It's supposed, to be it's supposed to be judging effectiveness. It's really judging efficacy. These are large-scale RCTs. They dominate the research. They're placed at the summit of hierarchy of evidence, level A evidence. To me, level A evidence is really taking a patient with type 1 diabetes who's dying and giving them insulin and saving their life. That's the best evidence. I don't think random, I put, it's like a mantra. Randomized controlled trials are level A, you know, et cetera, but I don't necessarily agree. Uh, so they, but they do dominate red glycerol. They're placed at the summit of hierarchy, right? They claim to be the most reliable means of establishing cause relationships in medical research. However, they are designed to identify small differences in outcome between active treatment group and controls, and that's just, you know, that's not individual patients. That's just like the mean of one group to the mean of another group. You know, what if you have uh, half the people do really great and half the people do lousy? Then it looks like the drug doesn't do anything, but half the people are going to benefit. So that's another problem with this kind of research. The proponents assert that the method, because they're randomized controlled trials that are blinded, so that all the groups should be exactly the same except for that one thing, the intervention with the drug, that excludes alternative explanations, namely that unequal distribution of other causal factors, bias, et cetera, chance. In other words, they believe that these studies have internal validity. However, that's really, you know, maybe not true. Randomization, allocation concealment, double-blind administration, handling of withdrawals and dropouts, statistical tests, they don't guarantee that conditions for internal validity have been satisfied. The frequentist approach to statistics, which continues to be used in almost all medical research, is unsound. Thirdly, and most importantly, the inference from a small difference in outcome to the presence of a causal relationship is highly questionable. 
Given these arguments, it's of some importance to note that neither the results of individual RCTs nor the statistical method in general can be tested independently. You can't repeat these studies, right? They're involving thousands of people under, with multiple center trials. They're costing a lot of money. You can't do these kinds of studies. So you can't actually validate this information with, a, with an independent study. So the inability to test the results of statistics-based research is a particular concern as fraud is more common than hitherto supposed in medical research. But even if we were to accept the validity of causal inference, okay, we still got problems, okay? Why? Well, you know, uh, how can you, can you rely on generalizing these results of an individual study to the wider popular patient, you know, the external validity problem? This is a big disadvantage in medicine, applying these things to individual people. That's not all. The size of the treatment effect in these studies is usually very small, and like I would say, some of them are pretty trivial. And then the product of these studies is really dubious and of doubtful meaning. Now that said, I did have to tell these folks that her doctor was doing totally conventional, right? Now she's 74. These are data in people over the age of 79, but in five years she'll be 79. And take a look at this. Even though there's really no evidence, okay, in people over 79, yet a third of them are on statins for primary prevention and half for secondary prevention when there's zero evidence, basically, zero evidence. So this is standard of care. Uh, but, you know, it's based on the number needed to treat. Okay, so you can go on the web, and this is a website that you can look stuff up. You know, it's an independent website, and so they evaluate the literature, and it's called the NNT, and they do quick summaries of quote-unquote evidence-based medicine. We talked about the evidence. And so even if you trust the evidence, statins given for five years for primary prevention, no mortality benefit, and the number needed to treat is 100. Secondary prevention, yeah, there's a little mortality benefit if you believe it, and the number needed to treat is 40 to benefit one person with a reduction in risk of a cardiac event, okay? Now, others would disagree. Dr. Thompson, when I queried him at the lecture, he said, well, it's 11, but he only, that was the 4S trial, and that's not, that, that is open to question, but that is certainly the lowest number you'll find, and a more generally accepted number is 25, okay? And that, Dr. Schaefer also lectured at, at uh, Bay State, and uh, that's the number he gave me when I asked him that question. Secondary prevention. He's a lipidologist. So the generally accepted number is 25, and I said that at the end, and then this professor of mathematics said, well, okay, you know, you're right, okay? I don't disagree with your analysis of the statistical data. However, hey, if it's 25, you know, and there's no risk, why not, right? Well, that's because he's a professor of mathematics. If he was a professor of chemistry, he might feel differently, like this professor, I found this lecture on the line, this professor from University of Maine, striking about these substances is the very early stage in the biosynthesis at which they act. That's his exclamation point. Okay, so he's pointing out that when you block the third step of cholesterol metabolism, you're not only blocking cholesterol metabolism, you're not only blocking intracellular cholesterol synthesis, which is very important for membrane biogenesis, it's also blocking all of this stuff. What are these? These are all isopre this is, these are all what are called isoprenoids. And isoprenoids have very important cellular actions. Uh, this one, and you're also blocking mevalinate. Mevalinate is important for DNA synthesis. This isoprenoid is also important for DNA replication. These um, isoprenoids, they participate in something called isoprenylation. So they have a prenyl group attached to proteins, and that's how the protein knows where in the membrane to go like the cell membrane or the, or the uh, vesicle membrane or the mitochondrial membrane. So you're blocking generation of proteins, which are important for cell differentiation. You're blocking ubiquinone production. You know, this is coenzyme Q10. You're blocking dolichol production, which is a, important for protein glycosylation. And so, you know, um, this professor of chemistry is not surprised that these guys have numerous side effects. Okay, so what's the number needed to treat to do harm? which you can get off this website, okay? So one in 100 were harmed because they developed diabetes, all right? So here's the latest evidence on diabetes. Well, you know, after 36 months, yeah, it looked like you needed to treat 100 people to do harm with simvastatin, and same thing with atorvastatin, 
But now that we have 64, 90, 60, this is actually a six-year follow-up, uh, and now it's even going out further, smaller numbers out here, you can see if you look at this, what is that, about 7%, and low-dose simvastatin and high-dose simvastatin. High-dose, which is you know, getting standard of care, higher the dose the better, uh, you're getting an increase of about 7% up to about 25%. That's an actual, that's not a relative increase. That's an actual increase of 15, 20%. And the same thing with atorvastatin. So the, you gotta wait to see you know, longer term data. If you just looked at data here, yeah, we're lucky, it looks like you need to treat 100 people to harm one, but out here, and she's not stopping it after one year. Now what's going on? They went a little further, these investigators. This has been a debate that's been going on as to whether this is due to a, a decrease in insulin secretion or an increase in insulin resistance. They're showing a uh, lowering of insulin sensitivity as being a more important factor than a reduction in insulin secretion. And that's important because insulin resistance may be a risk factor for atherosclerosis. Now this is interesting. So this is, an, this is a little bit more data published in 2015. Uh, statins and nuance of diabetes and diabetic complications. Now this is a retrospective cohort study. Okay, so this is not a randomized prospective study. It's a retrospective cohort study, but I thought it was interesting because diabetes went up statin non-users 19% to 31%, diabetes with complications 2.1 to 5%. Complications, okay? Now, their study was not designed to examine whether the increased risk of diabetes and its complications is outweighed by the reduced risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease because that's an assumption. Okay? that everybody that publishes in this field assumes that these drugs work great, okay? Well, but take a look at this. They did look at peripheral circulation manifestations, and lo and behold, the non-users versus the users, fourfold increase of peripheral vascular disease. And as I said, statins increase coronary artery calcification. That's an accepted fact. So I'm not sure that about that statement. Now, if I said that to any other audience, you know, if I went out nationally and did this, they would look at me like I've got two heads on. I can only say that in this audience because I have a little street credibility here, right, Sam? <laughs> but statins may actually increase your risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and this woman's pathophysiology of her atherosclerosis is not hypercholesterolemia because when we looked at her LDL particle size, it was light and fluffy. She didn't have small, dense particles, and so her pathophysiology is probably insulin resistance all these years. And so giving her statins to increase her insulin resistance could actually do her more harm than good in terms of cardiac risk. I'm the only person who's gonna say that, but that is maybe the fact. And there's a little bit of evidence for this, huh? Her HDL was over 100. You said it, good point, good pickup. <laughs> yeah, okay, so the other harm is muscle damage and they're saying, they're quoting one in 10. Now this is the only harm that he mentions in his talk. Dr. Thompson, and he does say if myalgias, if you get myalgias, just lower the dose or use them intermittently. That's what he said. That's all. That's it. So he's ignoring these data that statin therapy induces ultrastructural damage in muscles even in patients without myalgia. Okay, so they looked at all these, they looked at fibers, and you know, just bottom line here, they looked at 296 fibers in statin treated groups, uh, uh, 33 were damaged, and they found a single fiber damage in non statin treated patients. This is the damage we're talking about. These Z lines are all distorted, and they have uh, these larger sarcolemmal, subsarcolemmal fissures. Now, statins also, because of those ultrastructural changes, may, they also impair exercise training. And this is the latest. They actually screw up electron transport. And maybe that's just some of the statins that are turned into lactone derivatives. Other well-documented adverse effects of statins from up-to-date, inflammatory myopathies. Remember this statin, cerevastatin, Baycol, is that the brand name? It killed people. Okay, necrotizing myopathy without significant inflammation. This is interesting. Here's a case of immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy linked to statin use. T1-weighted pelvic MRI, you can see all the muscle atrophy. 
biopsy, you can see the muscle necrosis, but there's no inflammation. Okay, this is muscle, there's the necrosis, but there's no inflammation. Immunofluorescence, what are they showing here? Strong positivity to HMG-CoA reductase. Guess what? The overexpression of HMG-CoA reductase is causing autoimmune muscle disease. And this is just a case report, just recently published, but this may not be trivial. Take a look at this from rheumatology literature. Uh, increasing incidence of immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy. They saw nothing between two before 2007, and now they're seeing they're up to 18 cases. Our data show an increasing incidence of IMNM, immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy, which is mainly accounted for by anti-HMG coir reductase antibodies. And maybe, I'm just speculating, I have no data for this, but maybe this has to do with this push that's gone on the last decade to push the statin dose up and maybe you're really upregulating that MGMG coir reductase. And this is maybe permanent. You stop the statin, this may not solve it. I've seen definite, this is anecdotal, but I've seen definite cases of peripheral neuropathy, and I know it's from the statin, because you, if it's early enough, you stop the statin, it goes away. You reintroduce the statin, it comes back. Symptomatic peripheral neuropathy. Obvi okay, obviously elevation of liver tests, rare episodes of severe, severe liver injury, proteinuria believed to be you know, innocuous, and then rare episodes of renal failure. Well, you know, again, uh, maybe not so rare. Uh, this is about to appear in the American Journal of Cardiology, uh, looking at the risk of kidney disease in the overall cohort, statin versus non-statin, and you can see, yeah, it looks pretty rare down here. This is invent to days, okay? But then you kind of get out here, 2,000 days, the curves start to separate, so there's an actual risk increase. It's hard to see, but it's several, four, five, six, seven percent. And that's just nephritis, nephrosis, renal sclerosis. I don't have time to show you the chronic kidney disease and the unspecified acute and acute renal failure data. Okay, then uh, obviously, um, you know, the FDA came out three years ago, next month, saying that there is an issue with memory loss. So um, here's a blurb. I wish he'd remembered to say this in his lecture. This is a blurb from Barbara Robinson's book, The Truth About Statins, by Dr. Thompson. Presents the other side of the statin story, the side effect story, a story that many patients do not hear from their doctors. She reminds us that we have a very long, few long-term studies of these drugs and must be aware of their side effects before we follow the advice about putting it in the water. And you know, again, it really is, this is important. We have very few long-term studies. And now the long-term data is starting to accumulate. And it, 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 you know, it's looking worse. Okay, so then you get the issue of mortality. Okay, so here's statin drugs given for five years for heart disease prevention, primary prevention, no mortality benefit. All right, you've got to die of something, I guess, okay? So now in terms of this patient, she's 75, uh, but again in five years she'll turn 79, 80. Uh, we have some data from the PROSPER study. These are older folks, okay, elderly meaning in their mid-70s, and um, all cause, all cause mortality, all participants, the lines are identical, pravastatin versus placebo. So here's what happens to CHD death, okay? CHD death is down a percent or so, okay? And, incident, and that's statistically significant. Cancer is up, that's not statistically significant, but you know, use of statistics goes both ways. So there is biological plausibility for the fact that statins can, might, cause cancer. They're tumor-inducing agents. That's how they were first discovered. This whole class of compounds was discovered because they killed off almost the entire trout population in the United States by causing liver tumors from a mycotoxin. And that led endo to start exploring mycotoxins, toxic substances made by mold, like red yeast rice. And he came up with a mycotoxin called citronin that did markedly inhibit HMG coa reductase, but it was really too toxic. So he worked on another one, and he found this one called compactin. And compactin were proceeding, clinical trials were proceeding, but they stopped the trials because they were believed to include serious animal toxicity. Well, it turns out that, according to this uh, FDA historian, uh, Merck then, once they heard about compactin, they actually initially stopped the lovastatin trials. They gave it to Illingsworth, 
and I showed you that for familial hypercholesterolemia, because nothing else worked, but they stopped the clinical trials because compactin, the rumor was, was killing half the dogs from cancer. So there's biological plausibility that statins raise risk of cancer and dying of cancer. And now that's dog evidence. This is rodent evidence. So you see relative exposure. They're not uh, carcinogenicity of lipid-lowering drugs in rodents, OK? And so these are right in the you know, FDA application. And these relative exposures, 1 to 2, 2 to 7, 0 0.5, they're not that high. They're not you know, like we gave the mouse 50 times as much statin as a human's going to be exposed to. So how did it happen that the FDA approved it? Well, you know, they did a Freedom of Information Act, these folks, published this in 1996. The only reported discussion of animal carcinogenicity at the FDA Advisory Committee on Lovastatin was by Representative Merck. And obviously, they downplayed the importance of the studies. So they're pointing out that if this drug caused a rapid increase in a particular cancer, you might see it. But if it's an increase that can be delayed for decades, you're not going to see it right away. That's a problem, OK, putting this drug in the water, so to speak. So here we go, long-term statin use and risk of ductal and lobular breast cancer among women 55 to 74. Six months to five years, no difference. Five to 10 years, no statistically significant difference. Greater than 10 years, twofold. Relative risk, in relative, you know, relative risk increase. And that would be true of lobular as well, 2.4-fold. So you've got to wait 10 years to see it. And you know, that's death of cancer. This is, well, I'm going to skip that. When you pop this slide up, it reminded me of this joke. It's going around patient blogs. How many lipidologists does it take to prevent a heart attack? Just one. But you've got to bribe them to put you in the control group. <laughs> OK, but I just want to end with this, because this is really, this is a big reason why I wanted to get his slides, because I really objected to what he's about to say here. So he's saying that statins lower risk, even if the risk factor is not a high LDL, and that includes cigarette smoking. Now, that is just simply not true. Statins are like confession. They absolve the risk factor of guilt. And when he said that, I said, I'm sitting in the front row. Does that include smoking? And he said, yes, that includes smoking. So now I've looked at this literature. And then after this talk, I scoured the literature. Is there any evidence that statins reduce risk of heart attack or stroke in people who smoke? Well, I couldn't find much. Dr. Robinson doesn't think so. In her paper, she even points out that getting it down to less than 70 may be sufficient to stabilize a regress plaque, but it may be not sufficient for a patient who's smoking cigarettes or has poorly controlled diabetes or hypertension. This is the only data I could find, and I'm you know, willing to, I'm open to anybody finding data. This is the only data I could find that looked at current smokers on statin versus placebo and risk, low, and risk of and it's the mega trial, which is a Japanese study, looking at stroke, not heart attack. And here's the smoker. No, yes. No, yes. That's the data. There aren't any data, basically, that that absolves the risk factor of smoking. And this is really important. Because here's that slide I showed you earlier. CHD kind of peaked in 1965, and it's been a steady downhill since then. And so what happened in 65 was the Surgeon General report on smoking. Okay? And the cigarette smoking had been going up, and it started to drop. And it drops in parallel to the drop in CHD deaths. Okay? Now, statins were marketed here, right, 1987. Right? So no change in the curve. And this is going on. These are the most recent data. Here you see continued drop in CHD, continued drop in stroke. Here is cholesterol, but not a big change between 2000 and 2012, OK? And these are other, here's diet. Nobody's getting a better diet. This is the percent of people who are improving their lifestyle, improving their cholesterol. So People are not smoking as much, so the non-smoking rate is going up. These things are staying steady, and yet the uh, risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is continuing to drop even since 2007. Ironically, Fisher 
actually spoke out against the study that showed tobacco causes lung cancer because he said that correlation does not imply causation, but he might have been biased because he was a cigarette smoker. He also worked for the tobacco companies. So I'm just going to end with this. Uh, Fisher and Fuller Albright lived at exactly the same time. I don't know if they knew each other. They were both elected to the National Academy of Sciences around 1950. And uh, this is my bias, okay? My bias is that in the final analysis, very little is known about anything, and much that seems true today will turn out to be only partly true tomorrow. And I really want to thank everybody for your attention. And nobody went to sleep in a statistics lecture. I'm really impressed. And thank you very much. And I will take questions.